Thanks very much. Uh, that Forbes thing was actually number one living business thinker in the world as measured by social media. So <laughs> it's, uh, and that and four dollars will get me a frappuccino at Starbucks. <laughs> um, first, uh, before we get going here, uh, for those of you who are tweeting, uh, I assume, is, is there a hashtag for this event? Hashtag showcase. Hashtag showcase. H showcase, and I'm at dtapscott, at dtapscott. So um, I'm delighted to be here, and I, I really mean that. Um, talking to this group about the transformation of education and learning and higher education for a new period in human history is kind of like bringing Coles to Newcastle, <laughs> because uh, it may not feel like it, but you're actually one of the world's leading institutions in this area. So I'm, I'm thrilled to be asked to, uh, to come and speak to you. And what I'd like to uh, do today is to talk to you about some of the new stuff that's going on around the world, but also to try and convince you that what you're doing is actually participating in nothing less than the reinvention of civilization, because that's what we're going through right now. So, um, and I'm going to begin just by telling you a story that got me going on this whole question of how do we transform pedagogy, the nature of higher education, uh, for, for a new century. And it was in 1976, and I was taking a graduate course, at, of, uh, graduate course in statistics at the University of Alberta, and it was in a computer lab. And I had a computer, and connected to it was a slide projector that projected graphics. Onto, the, uh, onto a little screen. And uh, it was self-paced interactive learning, whole course. There were no lectures, but let's face it, the statistics lecture by definition is a bust, right? <laughs> There's no one size fits all for statistics. Everybody in the classroom is either bored or else they don't get it. <laughs> I went through things at my own pace. Things I understood, I went through quickly. Things I didn't understand, I went over and over until I got them. I remember thinking, man, if somebody saw me going over this again, they would think I was really dumb. But nobody saw me, and I went over it until I got it. I got an A. I ended up getting a scholarship, actually, in, in advanced multivariate. If we could just turn the volume down a bit, that would be really awesome. Thank you. Um, but most people, most people got an A, up from a, a B minus on the same set of standardized tests. So I thought, wow, this is going to transform all education. See, because anything where there's right or wrong answer, you do interactive computer-based learning. And that frees up the teacher from being a broadcaster of data to become someone who could work in small group discussions. And that's what we had, three things. Interactive learning for anything where there's a right or wrong answer, small group discussions, and the third was projects, where you get to collaborate together to solve problems. And I thought, man, boy, five, ten years from now, the universities will be completely transformed. <laughs> that was 1976. Why is this taking so long? Well, let me step back and give you a uh, a bit of historical perspective on all this. I think there's some massive transformations that are underway right now. Now, some of you may have seen Wikonomics. Uh, this book was about the corporation. And we argued that, this is my 13th book, actually, it, we argued that the internet is not about websites, eyeballs, stickiness, clicks, page views, dot coms, hooking up online, anything like that. It's a new global computational platform. It's a computer. And this is leading to a radical drop in transaction and collaboration costs in the economy. And that means that the way that we orchestrate capability to do things, in this case, to innovate and to create goods and services is changing very fundamentally. And it was about the corporation. And um, it, the book sold very well. It was actually the best-selling management book in the United States for the whole year. And then something happened. We saw the crash of the global economy. I mean, who would have imagined five years ago that one of the big themes of business books and magazine articles and so on these days would be 
How to Save Capitalism, or Is Capitalism Even Savable? And these books are not being written by Occupy types, they're being written by the capitalists. Um, Roger Martin, Richard Florin, and I, uh, uh, and myself, a couple of weeks ago, did a, 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 a two hour session. It was standing room only at the University of Toronto, um, a, cr a crowd as big as this one in all the other rooms, about what's wrong with capitalism and how can we fix it or is it fixable. Now, some of you may know this guy, Paul Krugman, uh, New York Times columnist, won a Nobel Prize, an economist, controversial guy. And for some reason, I've ended up speaking at the same event as him <laughs> recently. And he gets up and he says, look, when you have the meltdown of a financial services industry, you get a prolonged period of slump. Japan had one in 1992. They're still in a slump. He says, so get ready for a couple of decades of ugliness in the global economy. And that's the good news scenario, he says, because some really bad things can happen, like if, if Spain or Italy were to default on its sovereign debt, um, the, uh, the euro would crash, Europe would go into a depression, the global economy would go into a depression. So I get up on the stage and I look out and there are <clears throat> all these people in a fetal position. And um, <laughs> I say, look, far be it from me to debate a Nobel Prize winning economist, but I have a slightly different view. I, th I think that the future is not something to be predicted the future is something to be achieved. And we can achieve a very different future in the world today. But if we're going to do that, we need to know what the problem is. And the problem doesn't fall within the paradigm or the mental model of traditional economists who worry about things like the business cycle. And wh where are we? Is it a double dip or do we need austerity or stimulation? No. This is not a cyclical change that we're going through. It's a secular change. This is a turning point in human history. And this is the topic um, of my most recent book that really discusses a whole set of its institutions and, and uh, higher learning is one of the central ones. If you look around today, you'll see a whole set of institutions that are in various stages of being stalled or frozen or in atrophy or even failing, contrasted with the contours of a set of sparkling new initiatives that show how this thing could be rebuilt around a new medium of human communications and around a new set of principles. The industrial age is finally running out of gas. By the way, if you want to buy macroeconomics, the best way to get it is in massive volume. <laughs> Christmas is coming soon. You look like people with friends. No, seriously. <clears throat> I mean, these are 16 institutions. Every one of them is stalled, but you can see a whole new model emerging. The industri up the upper left there, industrial age corporation, typified by General Motors, America's greatest company. It went bankrupt. The financial system, the core modus operandi of Wall Street almost brought down the global capitalist system. It hasn't changed. The newspaper, the last newspaper in Canada will be published around 2025. The problem that newspapers solve isn't really a problem anymore. As one youngster said to us, if the news is important, it will find me. <laughs> Twitter is my newspaper. I've got it organized into all the different sections, essentially, of a newspaper. Now, the, for every one of these, the old model's collapsing and a new model's emerging. There are lots of tough issues. It comes to the newspaper, how do we ensure good journalism? How do we ensure investigative reporting? How do we pay journalists? How do we prevent this balkanization of the news so that we can all follow our own point of view? Maybe we'll end up in these little self-reinforcing echo chambers where the purpose of information is not to inform us, but it's to give us comfort. I think every kid should be studying media literacy, starting probably in kindergarten. Now, the university and higher education is one of these. And for every one, we have an industrial age model. It's a model where something at the top had control and it pushed down standardized units to passive recipients. The industrial age was an age of scale 
and it was an age of standardization. So mass production, push out products. And so mass marketing, push out ads. Mass media, you push out radio shows or newspapers or, or TV shows. Mass education, push out lectures. No, they we have the best model of higher education in the world that 17th century technology can provide. <laughs> it's based on the lecture. It's one to many, one size fits all. It's based on the teacher and the student is inert. And they're isolated in the learning experience. It goes like this. I'm a teacher, I have knowledge. You're a student, you don't. Get ready, here it comes. <laughs> to me, the lecture is the process whereby the notes of a lecture go to the notes of a student without going through the brains of either. <laughs> now, I appreciate the irony that I'm standing up here giving you a lecture. <laughs> but this is actually not a good way of learning. You know, you're, none of you are going to remember the 16 themes or the five principles or the, the uh, seven transformations of higher education that I'm about to tell you about. I'm just trying to convince you of a a big idea and to situate what you're doing in a broader context. So this is a time of great contrast where the old is failing and the new is emerging. Now before I get into it, let me just take you up another 30,000 feet. If you want to understand what's happening to education today, I think you, ne you need to go back a few hundred years. All around the world, as recently as decades ago, we had an agrarian economy in the Economic and political system was called feudalism, and knowledge was tightly concentrated in tiny oligopolies of the church and the state. People didn't know about things. There was no concept of progress. You were just born, you lived your life, and you died. And then along comes Johannes Gutenberg with his great invention. And over time, different parts of the society, new parts, new classes, started to get access to information and knowledge. And when they did, the institutions of feudal agrarian society appeared to be stalled or frozen or an atrophy or even failing. It didn't make sense for the church to be responsible for medicine when people had knowledge. So we had the Protestant Reformation. Martin Luther called the printing press God's highest act of grace. You saw the creation of parliamentary democracy, the nation state. There were national democratic revolutions all across Latin America and other parts uh, of the world. We saw the creation of science, the corporation, the industrial revolution, and the modern university. The university and, and, and uh, higher education was basi basically a place to keep the books way back under feudalism. But over time, people started to come together and around this place where they kept the books, and that became a, a place for teaching. And then with the printing press, books became more broadly distributed. So, it was all good, and it, it advanced our standard of living. Pe millions and millions of people around the world began to learn, but it came with a cost. And once again, the technology genie is out of the bottle. This time, it's very different. This is so important. The printing press gave us access to the written word. The internet enables each of us to be a producer. The printing press gave us access to recorded knowledge. The internet gives us access not just to knowledge, but to the intelligence contained in the crany of other people on a global basis, real time. I don't think this is an information age. It's an age of collaboration. It's an age of networking of human intelligence. And it's an age where people can participate in everything. Rather than the old media of the industrial age, a printing press and later radio, television, and broadcast, they were one to many, they were centralized, they were controlled, and they often carried the values of their powerful owners. You know that expression, freedom of the press is a great idea, especially if you own a press. Um, well now, with the internet, this is the antithesis of all of that. It's one-to-one, -one, it's many-to-many. -many. It's not centralized, it's highly distributed, and it has this awesome neutrality. It will be what we want it to be. And if we want it to be a platform to discover the heavens, like in Galaxy Zoo with 275,000 amateur astronomers mapping the millions and millions of photographs of galaxies that we have, it'll be that. 
if we want it to be a platform for the 20% of people with Lou Gehrig's disease in the United States who go on to patients like me to collaborate and to learn how to manage their disease, it will be that. If we want it to be a platform to organize against public education, as the people in the Tea Party are doing, it will be that. So that's why what you're doing is so important, because this is about people getting involved, bringing your legitimate expectations and what you know, I mean, I knew it in 1976. We know that there are better ways of learning than professors lecturing to students. Bringing those values and that knowledge to the table, and if we do this by the millions and millions around the world, then we will transform the world. So, why is this happening? Why are we all here today? Well, just some contextual stuff on drivers. First of all, we have the new web. This ain't your daddy's internet. Okay? You access the internet, the old web, through a PC tethered to a desktop. The new web, you access it through billions and trillions of inert objects that become smart communicating devices. The physical world is becoming connected. I have a friend in Toronto. Everything in his house that has electrical power has an IP address and all these things talk to each other. I have no idea what his refrigerator says to his toaster. <laughs> but um, he was actually bragging that his fence talks to his sprinkler system. And I said, well, Ken, why would you care? He says, well, Don, if a burglar comes over the fence, the sprinkler is my first line of defense. <laughs> so this is a, the, the internet is a big computer. Humanity is building a machine. Every time you go onto the web, and you post something, you do a Google search, put up a, something on Pinterest, you remix a, 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 some music or something, you're programming this giant global computer that we all share. And when we all have a big global computer, that means that learning can happen on an astronomical basis. You can have 300 million people studying 2,800 courses on something like the Khan Academy. Now the second big change is a demographic. We have a technology push, but we have a demographic pull. There's a new generation of learners that are emerging. Now I started studying kids about 20 years ago and I noticed how my own children were effortlessly able to use all the sophisticated technology. First I thought my children are prodigies. <laughs> and, uh, but then I noticed all their friends were like them, so that was a bad theory. Um, <laughs> So I worked with 300 kids back then and I wrote this book. And the, today they're not just growing up digital, they've grown up. The eldest are now in their 30s. And they're coming into the workforce, into the marketplace, into society, and there's no more powerful force to change every institution than the first generation of digital natives. I'm a digital immigrant. I had to learn the language. And they have no fear of technology it isn't there. It's like the air. It's like I have no fear of a refrigerator because I don't view a refrigerator as technology. So this is really important because first of all, this generation born between 1990, sorry, 1978 and 97, it's the echo of the baby boom. It's the biggest generation ever. We, <laughs> but we don't get this. In Canada, we call them the boomlet. They're not a boomlet. The echo is louder than the original boom. There are 8 million of them in Canada. There are 7.8 million baby boomers. So based on their demographic muscle alone, these kids are going to dominate the 21st century. But what makes them a real force for change is that they have different brains. Let me explain. <laughs> this barely got a chuckle. This is a slide from Growing Up Digital in 97. When I put this on the screen in 1997, people would fall off their chairs. They'd be laughing so hard. Today, everybody looks at it like, what's that weird thing? Why doesn't he have a tablet or something? <laughs> um, time online is not taken away from hanging out with your friends, learning the piano, talking to your parents, doing your homework, or kicking a football. Time online for kids growing up today is taken away from television. The baby boomers watch 24 hours a week of TV straight on. These kids come home, they watch 
less TV, but they watch TV, but they watch it differently. They come home, they turn on their computer, and they're in three different windows, and they're texting and listening to, you know, iTunes and, uh, and maybe talking on the phone, and they got uh, three magazines open and a video game going. Oh, yeah, and they're doing their homework <laughs> at the same time. And, but the TV may be on, but it's in the back, background. It's kind of like ambient media. It's like Muzak. And when they're online, what are they doing? Well, they're, rather than being the passive recipient of somebody else's video, like their parents, they're reading, organizing, authenticating, composing their thoughts, telling their stories, searching uh, uh, for stuff, scrutinizing, remembering things, so-called multitasking. This is changing the way a generation thinks. And the reason is, and some of you probably have studied this, a third of the human brain is developed during extended adolescence, age 8 to 18. And the number one variable determining what your brain is like after your DNA is how you spend your time. And if you spend, during this period, 24 hours a week watching TV, like my generation did, you get a certain kind of brain. If you spend an equivalent amount of time being the actor, the initiator, the organizer, that gives you a different brain. And I think that these are brains that are pretty good for the 21st century. Like, a parent came up to me and said, how, after one of these speeches, how can my 14-year-old be getting A's when she does her homework and five other things at the same time? So I asked him, well, does she really get A's? Is she a good kid? Does she have values? Does she get out? Does she have friends? You know, is she fit? Does she got balance in her life? And he says, oh, yeah, she's a great kid. And I said, well, first of all, we're not talking about a problem here. We're talking about something interesting. I don't think she is multitasking. I think she's got better active working memory and better switching abilities. Some, these are kind of executive functions. I can't even listen to iTunes and read my email at the same time, but my, my kids can because their brains work differently. So this is so critical to the whole question of the, the model of learning. See, I was pretty cool being a passive recipient of everything. I was a passive recipient of TV. Uh, I went to church on Sunday and I was a passive recipient of, of uh, uh, the, the, what the minister was telling me. And um, in the baby boomer family, the org chart was mom reported to dad and the kids reported to mom, right? <laughs> I was number one of five, so the dog reported to me. But, uh, <clears throat> but those communications all went one way. So I got to communicate to the dog, but not, not the other way, really. I, or, you know, to debate or anything like that. It was father knows best, right? It was enshrined in public culture. Today, the org chart of the family is more like the kids in the center. You got the parents and, and, uh, and step parents on the outside, and then you got grandparents and extended family and, 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 and stuff there. So then I went into the workforce and I got broadcast too. But today, kids have grown up interacting and they learn very differently. And there's a key driver of brain science on why we need to reinvent the model of pedagogy. It's not just that it's a better model, it's that we have a whole new generation of learners who don't learn so well with the old model. Now I think we fear what we understand. We got, you know, this is, this is the dumbest generation, it's the title of a book, how the digital age stupefies young Americans and jeopardizes our future. This English professor named Mark Berline says, don't trust anyone under 30. Um, I've debated this guy half a dozen times, right? And, uh, oh, kids are so stupid today. Their, their Generation Me, a book by Gene Twenge, says we've created a little army of narcissists. They don't give a damn. They're all focused on Facebook and YouTube and MySpace and tweeting and, and so on. It's a generation of... Uh, that's into all kinds of bad stuff, drugs and terrible rap, and oh, they're violent and they're bullies online, and, and, and they're net addicted, glued to the screen, losing their social skills. The internet is eating the neocortex of youth today. This is an awesome stereotype. <laughs> Trouble is, there's no data to support it. We did a $4 million research project. We interviewed 11,000 young people in 10 countries. We talked to everybody we could who knows anything about brain science and, and, and this new generation. It was the biggest study of any generation ever. There's no data to support that. They're not the dumbest generation, actually. They're the smartest generation. Kids are graduating from 
higher education like never before. It's never been tougher to get into the, the best schools. We've got um, uh, standardized tests at an all-time high. IQ, of course, has been growing year over year for many years. Now, there's a problem. The top third are spectacular. They're the kids at Humber. The middle third, <laughs> well, another, another great institution. They're the middle third are doing pretty well. The bottom third are dropping out of school in Canada and in the United States. But there are real reasons for this. It's not technology. These kids are coming from single parent families. They're pretty much poor. The mom doesn't have time to talk to the kids, let alone to work with them on their homework if she was so inclined. They're coming to school hungry. There's an old model of pedagogy in the schools that they can't relate to. There's all kinds of inner city stuff, gang stuff uh, that's related to a lot of that. This is not a failing of technology. It's a failing of public policy. You know, we're cutting back on education. This is ridiculous. And to blame the internet, it's kind of like blaming the library for ignorance. <laughs> so how about all the other stuff? They don't give a damn. Well, you know, youth volunteering in both high school and post-secondary has been growing year over year for 15 years. Ah, they're into drugs and alcohol. Well, actually, uh, the percent of kids who are clean in high school in the United States has been growing year over year for 15 years. Ah, they're a bunch of bullies and criminals. Youth crime has been dropping in Canada and the United States year over year for 15 years. We can be enormously hopeful about this generation. I think we fear what we don't understand. This is the first time in human history when children are an authority about something really important. I was an authority on model trains when I was 11. <laughs> Today the 11 year old at the breakfast table is an authority on this digital revolution that's changing business, commerce, government, learning, publishing, entertainment, every institution in society. When I was a kid, we had the generation gap, big differences between kids and parents over values and lifestyle. It doesn't exist today. Kids and parents get along really well in Canada. Look at your kid and your, and, 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 or your iPod and your kid's iPod. There's overlap. My parents didn't even like the Beatles, <laughs> let alone the doors. Um, <laughs> What we have today is a generation lap, where kids are lapping their parents on the digital track. And if you've got a teenager in your house, you know what I'm talking about. Who does the systems administration in your home? <laughs> so this is humbling. So that's what's going on here. That's, that's what's behind this fear. I, I want to move along, but just really quickly. This is a panel I did. I interviewed these youngsters. Um, in front of uh, audiences. On the left there's a uh, Torontonian, actually she now lives in Europe. Her name's Rahaf Farfouche. She was studying in Paris. Her boyfriend was in Toronto. So they turn on uh, video Skype all day long to keep their relationship going. They cook together across the Atlantic Ocean. So I asked her, Rahaf, your generation, do you use email? She says, no, uh, not really, Mr. Taft's got to mean email is sort of like yesterday's technology. And I said, well, if you did use email, what would it be for? She says, email is kind of like a formal technology, say, for sending a thank you letter to one of your friend's parents. That would be a good use <laughs> of email. I said, aren't you part of the dumbest generation? I bet you don't read the newspaper. You probably, you probably don't watch the evening news. You probably get your news from John Stewart and The Daily Show on Comedy Central. She said, well, I don't think that's a fair stereotype. I mean, I think I'm informed and my generation is, but you're right, I don't read the newspaper. And then she says, she's putting it back to me. She says, but Mr. Tapscott, have you ever seen one of those things? They come out once a day. <laughs> and that they're not hot link, they're not multimedia, and you get this weird black stuff on your fingers. She said, let me tell you how I'm informed. She describes how she curates her environment. She follows points of view she disagrees with. She says, you're right, I don't watch the evening news, but does anybody? I talked, Sam Donaldson told me the average age of the ABC nightly news is 64. <laughs> and she says, you're right, I do watch the Daily Show, but not to get the news. I don't think the Daily Show would be funny unless you know the news. 
Two down from her is Sherry Kong. Sherry is a 20-year-old student in New Zealand, hired with 80 other students by the government. Their job? To teach the teachers how to use the internet in the classroom. <laughs> I asked Sherry, what are the teachers like as students? She says, oh, Mr. Taft's got the, the teachers, they're awful. They talk in class, they don't do their homework. <laughs> And beside, <laughs> you just picture that. Um, and beside her is Michael Furtick. You know this kid, anybody? He's a kid. Yeah, uh, he's the granddaddy of them all. He's 28 at the time. I've known Michael since he was 13. He's from Toronto. Uh, when he was 13, he was the project manager on my website, growingupdigital.com. They made him the project manager because he was the oldest and most <laughs> experienced uh, on the team. When Michael was 15, his own website was getting 20 million page views a month and he sold it for an undisclosed seven or eight figure sum. One of the news, uh, Globe and Mail actually said that we probably only got a million dollars and I, I, I sent him an email, Michael you sold it for a million dollars, you should have called me and he writes back and he says, Don, legally I can't tell you how much I sold it for but I can tell you I'm very happy. <laughs> and, uh, and he didn't want the money to buy a Ferrari, he bought a cheap little car, but his mom had to drive around with him because he only had his learner's permit. Um, he wanted the money to invest in his next new venture. Check it out. It's called takingitglobal.org. And I'm going to talk about them in a second because they're deeply involved in the transformation of education. It's based right here in Toronto. So if you're designing a school, a college, a government, a corporation, a system of democracy, or whatever. These are the eight norms of the generation. And uh, I don't have time, but I'm going to be around for a while. We can talk about it. You know, I have freedom, freedom of choice. Choice is like oxygen. When I was a kid, I had three media choices. Today, kids have millions. They want to customize everything. I never got to customize the Mickey Mouse Club when I was a kid. They're a generation of scrutinizers. When I was a kid, I saw a picture. It was a picture. These kids, like, what is it? An animation, a mod, a uh, a morph, uh, you know, uh, has it been photoshopped? Um, generation with very strong values, integrity. Generation of collaborators, and they learn through collaboration. Generation that likes to have fun. We ask them, when you're online, what are you doing? Working, learning, collaborating, or having fun? And they, all around the world, they had trouble answering the question. It was like, they said yes, or those are all the same thing. When I was a kid, those were all different. When I was watching the Mickey Mouse Club, I was only doing one thing, having fun. But now working, learning, collaborating, having fun are the same. I think the kids have got it right. What are you doing today? Are you working or are you learning? It's called knowledge work. It's the same thing. Increasingly, we learn through collaboration, and hopefully you're having fun. It sounds like you are. I try and make my speeches fun because I find that people learn more when they're conscious. It's a generation that wants to have speed, not immediate gratification. No, that's a bad stereotype. They have legitimate expectations that there shouldn't be bureaucracy and things should happen fast, and it's a generation of innovators. So you put those two together and you get a social revolution. It's not just there are a billion people on Facebook, but the internet is becoming a new means of production, and it's becoming the foundation of everything, including learning. Um, and we're seeing the rise of self-organization as a powerful new force. How can you enable students to self-organize? And I'll just tell you a humbling story. This is about six years ago now. Somebody sent me an email saying, you know the senator from Illinois is trying to win the presidency or get the nomination? He thinks your book, Wikonomics, is the key to getting elected and changing America. Go to mybarackobama.com. So I go there, there's my book right on the screen. It says, we believe in the transparency, use of the internet every way possible, and the book Wikonomics by Don Tapscott, and he's saying, I'm asking you to believe not just in my ability to bring real change in Washington, I'm asking you to believe in yours. And I looked at this thing, and well, my first reaction was, I am the man. <laughs> Clearly. But not so fast, Don, because it turns out I'm not the man, you see, because um, there was a Wikonomics community, but there was also a single moms for daycare for Obama community. And there was a young firefighters for Obama community. He created a platform whereby 35,000 communities self-organized and that's what brought him to power. 
Self-organization has been around throughout human history. Language was a function of self-organization. There was no central committee of the English language that said this will be called glasses. It just kind of happened. But what used to take place over millennia can now happen really fast. This is revolutionary, and I use that term advisedly, because there's a revolution and revolutions underway. There was a big debate about the role of social media and social change. The, <laughs> it kind of goes on a little bit. The president of Turkey this week just said, social media is the most evil thing ever in society. <laughs> uh, or I paraphrase. But, um, and I was involved in this debate, but it got settled pretty much. One word, Tunisia. Then there was another word, Egypt. And another word, Bahrain. And another word, Libya. And there ended up being about 15 different words that settled the debate. Now, the Tunisian revolution wasn't caused by social media. It was caused by injustice, really, and oppression. It wasn't created by social media. It was created by a new generation of young people who wanted hope and who didn't want to be treated as subjects anymore. But the media was key in all kinds of ways that people don't understand. You know, during the Tunisian Revolution, snipers were killing unarmed students in the streets, protesters. So the kids would take their mobile device, take a picture, triangulate the location of the sniper, send it to friendly military units, because the military was split in a pre-revolutionary situation, and they came in and took out the snipers. You think social media is about hooking up online? For these kids, it was a tool of self-defense. Up until a year ago in Libya, before things melted down, there was, if you were a demonstrator in the street and you got injured, an ambulance would pick you up, it would take you to a hospital, you'd go in with, say, a broken leg, and you'd come out with a bullet in your head. The Assad and the regime was using the healthcare system to kill people. So a couple of youngsters created an alternative emergency healthcare system using Twitter. Somebody gets injured, tweets go out with a hashtag, they get picked up, they get taken to a makeshift medical clinic where they get medical care as opposed to being assassinated. So, now this is not simple. All revolutions in human history until three years ago had a leader and, and an organization and when the old regime fell, the new leadership took power. These wiki revolutions, as I've called them, happen so fast, they, they create a vacuum, and politics abhors a vacuum, and the danger is that the old regime steps in, or, or, or fundamentalist-type forces, and you can see that playing out in, in Egypt, for example, today. But it's not going to be easy, but the arc of history is a positive one, and this is all going in the right direction. The, the new social world is bringing about freedom, and the horse is out of the barn. The train has left the station. The cat is out of the bag. Help me out here. The toothpaste is out of the tube. We're not going back. <laughs> now this is leading to a very profound change in the, in the sort of deep structure and architecture of all of our institutions. And I'm a little bit behind, so I'm not going to tell you about this. But the, you can read in, in my work. I think the, the person who best understands best describe the meaning of the internet. He never wrote the internet. His name is Ronald Coase. He's 103 years old today. And 75 years ago, he wrote a deceptively simple paper uh, where he asked, what, why does the firm exist? Why do we bring all this stuff inside the boundaries of a corporation? Why, why aren't we all independents? Why do you have Humber College? Why don't we all just go out and be educators? And he said, the answer is collaboration costs. The cost of search in an open market, he said, this is 75 years ago, of finding all the right information or people or whatever to do something, be totally prohibitive. So we bring that inside the boundaries of institutions. Where you have, back then he said, where you have filing cabinets to find information and org charts to find people and so on. And he was right. The big industrial age corporation did all this stuff inside the boundaries. Along comes modern travel, transportation, telephony, telex. I uh, wrote a book called Paradigm Shift a couple of decades ago now, and I said the boundaries of, of the firm are becoming more porous. And then we saw the internet, the further drop transaction costs, and that led to what we have today with the new social web, is the transaction and collaboration costs are dropping so much that peers can come together 
and create value. And this is what's happening in higher education. It's peer production of higher education. Now, if you can create a, I don't know, an encyclopedia with two million people, it's in 240 languages, it's 20 times bigger than Britannica, and according to the big study that's been done, the quality is about the same. What else could you create? Could you create a computer operating system through peer production? Well, the Linux operating system is now the dominant operating system in the world. And nobody owns it. It's created by a bunch of volunteers. Linux announced a big new customer recently. China. <laughs> Very big customer. China. <laughs> um, could you create a physical good this way? Well, the Chinese motorcycle industry has dozens of little companies. They all cooperate together. And there's no OEM. There's no Harley Davidson pulling all the strings. This is now 40% of global motorcycle production. Get ready for the $1,000 car from China using the same model. So these forces, they're tectonic. They're coming together and they're causing us to rebuild our institutions around a new set of principles. Collaboration, around openness and transparency, around sharing around interdependence. I mean, in business, I speak to businesses, audiences, as I say, look, business can't succeed in a world that's failing. And around integrity, about being honest, about really caring about the interests of your, your students. It's not about me, the teacher, it's about how are they learning. And it's about abiding by your commitments. So, that's the, thank you, that was the introduction <laughs> to what I want to tell you. Uh, <laughs> you've been very patient. Um, Let's talk about you. So first of all, this is a knowledge economy. It's an age of networking intelligence, but we create value by brain rather than by brawn. And that means many, many things. You know, when I was a kid, I graduated um, from college and, and I was pretty much set for life. All, the, the idea was you get this knowledge, then you just keep up in your chosen field. Well, today, kids who graduate from college today are not set for life. Let me exaggerate. They're set for 15 minutes. And, you know, if you took a technical course, often, you know, a big chunk, up to half of what you learned in the first year has changed by the time you get to the fourth year. Think about computer science 101 compared to what, what it was five years ago or ten years ago. So, this is the notion of lifelong learning. You know, that your career is going to be like a, a milk carton. It's got a time stamp on it. It's going to go sour really fast if you're not constantly in reinventing it. So, of course, universities need to enable students to learn and to acquire knowledge. But that's not the only thing anymore. You see, because it's not just what you know when you graduate that's critical. It's your capacity to think and to learn lifelong and to solve problems and to put things in context and, and to collaborate and to know the meaning and importance of stuff, to work with others. So that's a huge change that's underway. Now, what's wrong with the old model? Well, I said, teacher focus one way, one size fits all and the student's isolated. We need to move to a new model. And the lecture is uh, an extraordinary thing. I mean, lectures are an okay way for motiv motivating people, but I've been, and I've been studying what you do and the whole idea of moving away from lectures. You still do lectures, but they have a very different role. They're not for instruction. They're more for context creation or for motivation. Now, just a couple words on K-12, to because this can get us going. Every kid in Portugal is getting a computer. Now, they've made some mistakes with this, and I was involved in it. Um, but uh, done through a partnership with a bunch of technology companies. The parents all pay a little bit and the government is making a contribution, but the government of Portugal is, uh, doesn't have a lot of money. But I was, in, this is, I was in one of these classrooms and the student stands up and she says, okay, kids, now we're going to uh, uh, study um, astronomy. Everyone go to the astronomy blog, she calls it, and um, today we're going to learn about something called the equinox. The, who knows what an equinox is? These are seven-year-olds. Nobody knows. She says, okay, you know the deal. 
the deal is go find out what an equinox is. And, the, and you can do it by yourself, you can partner up, you can create a little group. The classroom explodes, it's so noisy. These kids are running around and, and they're, onto, they're onto Google and Portuguese Wikipedia and they're looking through their uh, blog and this, this little team figures it out and they say, we know what an equinox is. They start explaining it to the rest of the class and the teachers interacting and helping guide them. The other kids are asking questions and they're searching to find the right place. They're learning how to learn, they're <laughs> for lifelong learning in a, in, in a networked age. They're loving astronomy, and they're loving learning. Oh, but we can't afford this see in Canada. You know, because we have to have austerity. Oh, we can afford for bank workers to have technology. We can afford for government employees. We can't afford for our children to have their birthright access to the communication and learning medium of their time, we do a great disservice. And we need to find the leadership to turn this around in the country. Just uh, some examples of some interesting things that are going on. Uh, the Media League, have you heard about this one? It just launched, it's actually based in Toronto. You know, I have sports leagues in all the schools. They're trying to create a media league in all the schools where kids collaborate to create media, films, music, um, uh, uh, video, uh, <laughs> poetry, wh whatever, and there are competitions that will be held. This can be rolled out across Canada and the United States. It's an exciting thing. I think it will be a very successful Canadian company. Taking it global is now cultivating future-friendly schools. This is Michael Furtick's organization, again based in Toronto. Um, and they've got these programs on global citizenship, environmental stewardship, and student uh, voice. TIGWeb.org, just go there and check it out. ...to transcend disciplinary boundaries and require the very type of collaborative problem solving they seek to address. Thank you all for such an engaging and informative discussion. Do you have any final words of wisdom? It's a hard problem, and no one should expect quick results. You can't force progress in theories of learning, and you can't have applications for learning without the theory. It's not about standardizing, it's but about Robinson. raising standards, and that's something different. Victor Hugo says there's nothing so powerful as an idea whose time has come. What a terrible picture. The time has come for us to reinvent education, and thankfully we have a new generation that is going to make it happen. <laughs> this is a claymation. And I, I, I saw this tweet from Sir Ken Robinson, you know, who's a big leader in education. His TED Talk was watched by uh, 10 million more people than my TED Talk. <laughs> but mine had 1 million, but, um, and it's the most watched TED Talk ever. It's a fabulous uh, thing. But this woman, Elisa Acosta, is uh, for her project to become a teacher in Toronto created this claymation where the three of us were all talking about education. And I saw this tweet from Ken Robinson saying that, that he was in it and I was in it and so on. I checked it out. So uh, Lisa now works for me. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, she puts together all my multimedia and, and decks and stuff as well. Okay, so let me um, tell you a bit of a maybe disturbing story here that will help set, set this up. Um, I was hired by Florida State University to um, come and talk to them about what a 21st century university looks like. And there was a very small group, 25 people, it was all the management, the deans. And they're, do they're doing a billion dollar fundraising campaign, they want to be the first 21st century institution of higher learning, they say. So we sat there and we had a long lunch, three hours. And I started off talking to them about my view, and you kind of heard my view. We need to reinvent the model of pedagogy. It's not about technology, it's about a relationship between the student and the teacher in the learning process. And we need to change the nature of the institution and its relationship to other institutions in society. So I'm, this is a fairly short talk. And um, so they said, well, that was very interesting. The dean beside me says, well, before we get going, why don't we ask Joe, this guy named Joe in the room. And uh, he says, Joe, you're the one student. Why don't you tell us what you think? And so Joe starts talking. He says, well, I've been listening to this, and it, you know, it's resonating with me. It never really occurred to me, but I think as a generation, we do learn differently. 
Let me give you an example. I don't read books. And the look in the room was kind of the look in this room. You know? <laughs> and he says, and I'm paraphrasing here, okay, because this is like three years ago now, but he says, um, I think I'm knowledgeable, so he sort of knows what's in books, but he doesn't read books. He says, if I need information, I go onto the web, and I'm really good. Uh, I got good BS detectors, I know what's BS and what's uh, truthful. If I have to read a book, I'll start by going to Google Books and, and you can get a free chapter. And I'm good at figuring out what's the right chapter to know someone's thesis. And if I have to actually read a whole book, I don't follow someone else's narrative. I go into the book, I'm in the table of context, I'm in the uh, contents, I'm into the index, I'm out onto the web and asking people and social and I'm coming back. I don't read books. So the dean of the film school, um, it's a very uh, well-known film school, is sitting beside me and he says, well, thank you, Joe. I don't know if that's very interesting and exciting for us or for it means the end of civilization. <laughs> um, so they have this amazing conversation. I was thrilled with it, challenging all kinds of fundamental things. At the end of the conversation, I go up to Joe. I said, that was really interesting what you said. I'd like to get to know you. And he says, I can't. I'm, I, I have to go to Fort Lauderdale. I said, perfect. I've got a little plane for the day. I'll take you there and we'll talk on the plane. And uh, so we get in the plane. I start interviewing him. I say, so tell me about yourself. He says, what do you want to know? He says, uh, I, I said, uh, what kind of student are you? He says, I'm a good student. I said, how good? He said, well, I've always had A's. 4.0, uh, grade average. And uh, I said, that's good. Um, I said, what else do you do? He says, well, I'm the president of, students universe, uh, of the Students' Council here. I have been for two years, and um, I have a budget of $12 million. I'm on 18 committees, and I chair 11 of them. And that takes a fair bit of time. I said, I'm sure it does. Um, I said, anything else? He says, well, the usual kind of sports stuff. I, I like sports. I'm not really great. Uh, he said, I guess, I guess the really big thing in the last while is that um, when Katrina hit, my girlfriend was from New Orleans, so we went down there to see what we could do. And uh, there was no health care clinic in the devastated Ninth Ward, so I set one up. I said, you set up a health care clinic? He says, yeah, I mean, you have the internet. You can do anything you want to do. You need an air conditioner, you can get an air conditioner. I said, cool, how'd it work out? He says, great, I mean, it's still functioning. It's called the Ninth Ward Health Care Clinic in New Orleans. It sees 9,000 patients a year. I said, well, that's good. <laughs> I said, anything else? And he said, well, the other thing is me and a couple of buddies, we've created this thing called the Global Peace Alliance, and we're trying to get a, a meeting of uh, 80 uh, world leaders at a summit uh, to talk about how we can end war. And uh, I said, that's good too. Um, so I said, T tell me about your family. He sighs. And I'm thinking, oh, what's going on here? He says, it's a tough topic. The last year, my, both of my parents died. One got sick, another was in an accident. I said, oh, Joe, I'm so sorry. Um, I, I said, do you have siblings? He says, yeah. I got a bunch of siblings and I'm the eldest, so it's my job to keep the family together. And I said, well, did they live here in Tallahassee? He says, no, they're in Lauderdale. Um, I said, well, how do you keep the family together? He says, well, we're on, online all day long. He says, you know the best thing I found? We created a family guild on World of Warcraft and we slayed dragons together. <laughs> said, That's so cool. I said, what are you doing next year? He says, well, I'm going to London and I'm going to uh, study. I'm doing a master's degree. I said, great, where are you going? He says, Oxford. I said, a master's in what? Philosophy. Oxford and Cambridge be the two hardest places in the world to get into for a master's degree in philosophy. I said, congratulations. I, um, and he says, yeah, one of the things I'm so excited about is we're going to have the British health care system. He says, because when we were kids, we just never went to the doctor, you know, because we, we couldn't afford it. And so he knows all about the British health care system. He knows about Maslow's hierarchy of needs. He knows about Plato's views on education. He's as knowledgeable as anybody I've met. He doesn't read books. I said, so did you get some financial aid? 
uh, to do the uh, degree. And he says, oh yeah, it's great. I got this scholarship. It covers everything. I said, cool. Where'd that come from? He says, well, it's called a Rhodes Scholarship. <laughs> the Rhodes Scholar from Florida in 2008 doesn't read books. Bob Dylan, there's something going on here and you don't know what it is. Now, it turns out Joe went to Oxford, and we've kept up, and he says, Don, um, I'm sending this email uh, uh, from a cafe because Oxford doesn't really have the internet, and uh, <laughs> I spend a lot of time in the library. You know that thing about reading books? I'm reading a lot of books. <laughs> <laughs> so it turns out he can read books, and of course he, he reads fiction, but for nonfiction, I mean, you may have seen it. Uh, it was a while ago, uh, this announcement came out after 14 books, Don Tapscott's new book is not a book, it's an app. And it's free on, on the iPad. Just go to the app store and type in Don Tapscott and you'll get the app. And I mean, the nonfiction book, Joe's kind of nailed it. I mean, it's, 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 <laughs> it's, it's made of atoms. That's the first problem. And it's not multimedia, it's not hot linked, it, it, it's not social, it doesn't, enable you to engage with other people during the learning process. So, so this is a huge change. Now Joe's an extraordinary youngster, but he's more typical of this generation than not in terms of how his brain works. So let me just give you some real kind of up-to-date answers. You know about uh, flipped classrooms in higher education. Actually, I'm just going to skip through uh, this stuff. Uh, we got, right, well, TED is a great example. I gave this TED talk. A million people watched it, but somebody flipped it, and they created a course. Um, you know, you can flip the video. You know what a flipped classroom is. You, you do the lecture and the learning and stuff privately, and then you, best, if it's, acquiring facts or something where there's a right or wrong answer through interactive learning. Then you come to the classroom to collaborate and to do projects and to learn and, and uh, stuff like that. So this is a flipped classroom um, uh, at uh, Boston University. And it's one of a, a growing number of college engineering courses uh, in which innovative educators are transforming the classroom into active uh, learning. So. And the idea is that this is replacing the traditional lecture hall with these kinds of things. So um, it says here in the description, Engi in engineering mechanics, um, I with a learning studio, I learned with a learning studio to collaborate at round tables to solve problems under the guidance of faculty and graduate teaching fellows. Now, um, that's a big change. Uh, we've got the this is the University of Toronto. This is what a lecture hall looks like now in engineering. So it changes to the physical design as well. Um, it, this is the physics department, and they've reinvented the first year physics course. It used to be you sat there for physics 101. It used to be like 1,000 people in a lecture hall. And there's no one size fits all for, uh, for physics. These are three to five students that work together in a group. And the prof is freed up from being a transmitter of data to becoming someone who curates or customizes a learning experience. Um, do you know the story about Stanford? And <laughs> they uh, put an AI course online and 270,000 students enrolled. And a whole bunch of them graduated, more than had ever graduated in all of the history of Stanford and artificial intelligence combined. This happened in the first year. Um, so MOOCs, you know MOOCs, massively open online courseware. So Udacity, there's this guy um, named uh, Sebastian Thurn. He's a genius. He works at Google. He's running all Google's intelligent transportation stuff, but he's also created this thing called Udacity. As of April 18th, 2013, it had 24 active courses. And the goal next year is to have 160,000 students um, and um, being active in learning environments. 
Okay, the really big one, of course, is Coursera. I went on last night to see there are 3,800,000 students on Coursera. So there would be way more people in higher education on, on MOOCs than in all of the higher education institutions in the world uh, uh, combined. It was 300,000 last year. It's 4 million this year. That's what you call a fast uh, growth rate. Um, then we have edX. So the folks that brought you the MIT Harvard Open Courseware Initiative said, whoa, we can't have Coursera in the private sector doing this, so we're going to create a not-for-profit thing, and edX is that. Who, just a sanity check, who's heard of edX in this room? Okay, many of you. These are all things, I'm just, again, I'm not trying to instruct you, I'm just, these are things that you can go and learn about. But it's an open source platform, so you have the world will create this, and ultimately this, because openness tends to win in the end, this ought to uh, beat Coursera, uh, but we'll see. But it gets more interesting. You know about mechanical MOOCs? So rather than having people developing courses, these are software bots that go out and patch together existing resources from open learning sites to create courses. So eventually we can create an infinite number of courses. And this addresses one of the, the biggest problems in higher education learning. How weird is it that we have, what, 10,000 statistics professors all around the world, each developing their own little notes and PowerPoints and tests and software and routines and instruction methods and class handouts and so on. It's really weird <laughs> if you think about it. We should be cooperating together uh, to do that. So. Um, but it's not just going to be humans that will be cooperating. We have these bots. Um, so a new course, a gentle, in, a gentle introduction to Python uh, that blends content from MIT's OpenCourseWare, gives instant feedback exercises, quizzes from Code Academy, study groups open, organized by OpenStudy, and would be coordinated through an email list operated by the peer-to-peer -peer university. So then we've got... Um, Peer-to-peer -peer you. Do you know about this? Remember I said peer production. That's why I give you that long introduction. Um, this is peers can now come together and create value. We don't have to do it in the old ways. Now this is a huge threat in some ways to the traditional institution. And at, at uh, Davos this year, there was a panel with the uh, presidents of Stanford, MIT, and Harvard, along with some other people, Bill Gates and stuff like that. And these presidents pretty much said, we've had our head in the sand, and the university is now in danger of losing its monopoly over higher education. And we need to really step up to this question. And so, you know what's happening with MOOCs, is they can now be integrated into a, into a, a traditional institution's program. Again, if there's a right or wrong answer, the online stuff is great, but you still need a physical place. And the campus is wonderful. I was in a debate about this, and there was a guy named Marvin Dressler. Uh, the, uh, he was the head of sociology at Princeton for 20 years. We were talking about, I said, look, at, I, I think there's a role for the physical campus. And he says, oh, I agree. Among other things, the college is a great place for young people to go to for several years and get older. <laughs> and they're bound to learn something while they're there. <laughs> um, so. But these institutions have got to step up or else um, there's going to be a lot of grief. Okay, so here's uh, Sophia. And I'm, I'm just going to tell you how they describe themselves. <laughs> Sophia was created with a vision of transforming education through a vibrant online community of teachers and learners. Sound familiar? Our goal is to provide self-paced, inspirational, and relevant curriculum to learners at all stages and ages. We built an education platform that's customizing the way students learn by offering more than, 30, more than 32,000 tutorials on a variety of academic topics taught by thousands of teachers. This vibrant, first-of-a-kind learning community helps teachers enrich their classrooms, empowers students to learn in their own way, and provides a pathway to an affordable college degree. So, I'm, I'm raising this to make a point. This is either a huge threat to the traditional college or university, or it's the biggest opportunity ever. It's like the internet was either the biggest threat to the music industry or the biggest opportunity ever. The music industry took the wrong approach. 
they used a legal and traditional solution to address a technology disruption rather than having a business model innovation. And the industry that brought you Elvis and Beatles is now suing children. Um, <laughs> in, in macroeconomics, we found the number three source of revenue for the U.S. labels is suing people who love music. It's terrible. Um, then we've got all of these peer learning networks, connect, share, learn. So this researchers at Harvard have launched the Peer Instruction Network, a new global network uh, for users of interactive teaching methods. Use the flipped classroom, all the same stuff, rather than lectures, interactive, self-paced learning. More peer learning networks. Learn real, t real word skills from incredible teachers. So Skillshare, this is a global community of teachers with students, and the teachers are all incredible. Um, and you have all these peer feedback sessions, so students um, and, and peers can get involved. You opt in, you have a, prod, a project, and that can be shared with your fellow students who will evaluate your project. Everybody learns together, that's their theme. Then we got the rise of big data. Everybody's talking about big data. But this is really <laughs> creating an incredible opportunity, um, not mainly for MOOCs, but for institutions like Humber. Five points. Individual learners can reflect on their own achievements and patterns of behavior in relationship to others. How did I learn about that analysis of variance compared to others? Secondly, as predictors of students requiring extra support and attention. I just want to tell you a little story about that. After Growing Up Digital came out, I was at a cocktail party. and It was in Toronto. And a woman in her 60s came up to me and she said, you're Don Tapscott. I, want to, I just wanted to meet you because you changed my life. And I said, tell me more. She says, well, I teach at one of the independent schools, Branksome College. I'm a math teacher, grade 9 and 10. And I read this book, and I saw you give a lecture about changing pedagogy. I decided to do it. We got computers into the classroom um, and some instructional software for math. I don't give lectures anymore. Kids interact, and we have small group discussions. She says, those kids are learning better than they ever did. Performance is way up. She says, but a key thing is I know more about every one of those kids after a month than I did after a year because she's got the data. The other thing she says is the best part is I'm a new woman. <laughs> I wake up in the morning, and I can hardly wait to come to school. It makes me so sad when I see teachers and educators say, Ah, uh, you know, I'm getting near retirement, reinventing the model of pedagogy. Somebody else can do that one. You know, wow, who gets to reinvent their knowledge base and become a new woman? You know, when you're in your 60s, how cool. Um, big data is also critical to help teachers and support staff plan interventions with individuals and groups. It's for course teams seeking to improve current courses or develop new curriculum. curriculum and for institutional administrators taking decisions on all kinds of matters. You know, marketing, uh, resources, recruitment, uh, effectiveness, compensation, everything. SOLAR, Society for Learning Analytics Research, same thing. Big data in higher education. Um, you know, I'm, I'm behind here, but th that we can learn about completion rates. We can start to get evidence-based education for the first time. We're always just winging it in the past. You give lectures, you have assignments, you hope to practice in repetition, students can recall stuff to you, and you look, look at their, um, their test results. Well now, the, the kind of data that we can get is very, very different. Media literacy, huge thing. Interpretation is social. Salon is a high-power web platform where users can read, annotate, and discuss visual media. So they come together and, again, kind of peer collaboration. Augmentation and reasoning. I love this. It's called Convince Me. Um, this is about developing your reasoning capacity. Convince Me is a reasoner's workbench. It's a computer program to help students restructure and assess their knowledge, often about controversial situations. So it helps guide people to first categorize their own propositions as either evidence or hypothesis. You know that thing, uh, everybody's entitled to their own opinion, but not everyone's entitled to their own facts. 
um, indicate the reliability of various evidence, connect their propositions with both explanatory and contradictory competitive links, and rate each other's propositions believability. So, um, knowledge forum. What is this one? I don't even know. Um, <coughs> The role of the campus, I kind of talked about that. I think the physical place is important. Learning is social, and social needs to be more than just online. Um, there's all kinds of uh, great smart stuff. This is, this is Socrat, Socrative uh, learning. It's a student response system that empowers teachers by engaging their classrooms. And, uh, Socrative is, is very cool because uh, basically uh, students log on and, um, and they interact real time with the content. And their responses are visually represented for multiple choice, true, false, or short answered uh, questions. So how about the issue of credentials? Oh, colleges are safe, universities are safe because all these other things don't grant degrees. What is a degree? What is a diploma? What is a credential? It's just a reflection that you have accomplished something of certain value. If the people learning through alternative ways can perform better, then the value and the basis for the credential becomes undermined. And so the whole credentialing thing is changing. I mean, why can't you, um, you know, study an introductory music course at Humber and uh, get your AI from, um, from Stanford and your, uh, you know, your whatever computer science 101 from MIT and those credentials get built into uh, to a hum Humber uh, credential. Okay, so I could go on and on here. Um, this is familiar to you, I believe. Uh, the gamification of learning, uh, just wonderful stuff that's going on here at Humber. Um, experiential learning. This is a student that's been studying all night. Um, <laughs> no, this is the, it's called the crime lab um, at Humber. Everybody uh, knows about this. It's pretty cool. I mean, rather than reading books and having lectures and looking at videos, you actually become a CSI type person and figure out who done it. Um, health sciences, same thing. You're actually kind of got patience. Um, Stillwell, Ontario. Everybody know about this? This is, this is Humber uh, as well. Welcome to uh, the virtual neighborhood of Stillwell, Ontario. So students are all working together to build this. So thank you for contributing to my decks about <laughs> the transformation of learning. What you're doing is wonderful. But one final point. This is not just about a change in pedagogy. It's a change in how content gets created. I think we need a meta college or meta university. Call it the global network for higher learning. What we have now is content exchange where people share content. You share your PowerPoints and your bits of software and stuff like that. But we can move to a level two where we co-innovate together. And we're in the early days of this. Co-innovating the content of higher education all around the world. And eventually the school is not just a place, but it's a node on a global network of higher learning. Could Humber step up and be a world leader in doing this? Not just reinventing Humber, but participating in the transformation of higher learning around the world. You'd, you'd do a great service to all of us if you could do that. So, some big drivers for change, technology, demographics, social, and economic, causing us to rebuild all these institutions around a new set of five principles. And if it feels overwhelming sometimes, you are not alone. This is happening in at least 16 of the institutions that have grown up during the industrial age, and we need to rebuild them all around a new model. So, final thought, this is a new paradigm, you know? Paradigm's a mental model. Paradigms put boundaries around what we think. They constrain our actions, and they're often so strong 
that the assumptions are so strong that we don't even know that they're there. The Earth is at the center of the universe. That was a paradigm for millennia that dominated. The, the big problem in the world is communism. We live in a bipolar world. Remember that one? Teachers teach. And something can happen in art, science, culture, technology, whatever, that causes a change to occur. And that's what's happening today. And when you get one of these, you get a crisis of leadership. New paradigms, they cause dislocation, a conflict, uncertainty. They're nearly always received with coolness or worse, and vested interests fight against change. And leaders of old paradigms have the greatest difficulty embracing the new. You know, Galileo had a rough life trying to convince the church that the earth wasn't at the center of the universe. Do you know when he was exonerated by the Pope? It's like 20 years ago. The Pope said, yep, Galileo was right. The world is not flat. So, how are we going to find the leadership for change? Well, that comes to you in this room and the other rooms that are connected here. Um, you have an advantage because, in some ways, you haven't been around long enough to be a leader of the old. <laughs> and you have a DNA that has sort of started with the new model. And that's a wonderful thing. So, it, it also means that leadership can come from anywhere. Now, it helps if you have someone at the top who's very smart and who gets it as you do, but um, the person at the top, as Peter Senge said, to go back to Chris, can't learn for the organization as a whole anymore. Things are getting too complicated, which is why leadership is each of our personal opportunity, if we will it. It's not Chris's opportunity, it's yours, if you will it. So, this is a time of big change. And in all of these institutions, the stakes are very high. It's door number one, door number two. Um, I'd like to end with a, uh, by stretching your brain a little bit, and I'd like to share with you some uh, research that I've been doing. I've been studying nature recently to try and figure out what no, new human organizational forms might be like, because I've studied thousands of human organizations. Um, Fish come in schools, birds come in uh, flocks, uh, bees come in swarms. Over the moors of England, in the cold winter nights, starlings come in something called a murmuration. You know this word? A murmuration. It refers to the murmuring of the wings of the birds. It's noisy. And starlings are out over 20 mile radius doing their starling thing, and at night they come together. This protects the birds. Look at that. On the right, that's a hawk, a fearsome predator being chased by the collective power of the little birds. The murmuration has a function. It warms the birds up for the cold night ahead. There's a lot of exchange of information, and it's a way of protecting them. Now, scientists that have studied this have said they've never seen an accident. And there's leadership, but there's no one leader. Leadership changes, and when the moment is right, this is one of the most spectacular things in nature. Now, do we learn something from this, or is it just kind of <laughs> sort of a taps God fanciful analogy here? Well, this thing kind of functions to the themes that I've been talking to you about today. It's a big collaboration. There's a huge openness. There's a sharing of all kinds of information, and there are some standards and kind of rules that govern how it works. The big one being don't bump into anybody else. Um, but they're sharing information about food sources, about danger, about all kinds of things, nesting. And they're jockeying for position and status and mates and all kinds of things are going on here. And there's a, a sort of interdependence where the individual birds understand that they can only be successful if the collective is successful. And this gives the birds this great uh, integrity where they have the courage somehow to take on a fearsome competitor. Just like business can't succeed in a world that's failing, they somehow understand that their world needs to succeed for them to survive and be successful. So imagine 
if you'll go, just bear with me. Imagine if we could connect ourselves on this planet to a vast network of glass and air. Could we go beyond to sharing information and knowledge? Could we start to share our intelligence? Could we create some kind of collective intelligence that goes beyond an individual or a group or a college or a community? Could we create some kind of consciousness that extends beyond an individual? Well, if we could do that, we could do some great things. You know, the learning organization, we've had so much trouble creating this. Maybe the precondition wasn't there. Maybe we didn't have conscious organizations. Maybe organizations like people can't learn unless they're conscious. During the Egyptian revolution, people said Mubarak is too strong. The kids are gonna go home. He's gonna crush them, they'll give up. And I wrote at the time, I don't think they will go home because if they do, he will hunt them down and kill them. Just like if this picks up, the individual birds will become prey. So, I don't know. I look at this thing and I get a lot of hope, really, that this smaller world our kids inherit might be a better one. And that if we have the kind of, of, uh, of passion that you do for the transformation of learning, if we can extend that around the world, then maybe this age of networked intelligence will be an age of promise fulfilled and of peril uh, unrequited. Thank you very much.